So, I had a really stupid idea. You know how everyone's talking about the total eclipse on April 8th, and scientists are like obsessed with this idea of seeing the sun's corona. This outer layer made up of these streams of, of wispy plasma, which normally you cannot see because the sun, when you look at it directly, by the way, don't look at it directly, it's too bright to make out that part of the atmosphere. It's a bit like if I take this light, and let, let's just kill this light here while I do this. So if I'm holding this light and I do this and I turn it on, you can't really make it out very well, right? If I turn the light off, you can, you can make out the detail of the object that I'm holding, but if I turn it back on again, you lose all of that. That's kind of what's hap- we can turn on the light. That's kind of what's happening with the sun's corona. It's about a million times dimmer than the sun itself. So if the definition of a solar eclipse is just the moon blocking the sun, then shouldn't I just be able to kind of do that myself? Like, shouldn't, in theory, the corona just kind of magically appear without me having to actually wait for a solar eclipse to happen? Like I said, it was a stupid idea. Not that stupid, mind you, because modern telescopes actually do this. But in the end, I found out it's hard to beat the real deal. And very smart people will go to very great lengths to squeeze every bit of science they can out of solar eclipses. We care so much about the sun's corona because it is the part of the sun that is closest to us on this tiny little planet we call Earth. And when the sun gets excited, as it sometimes does, it spits out these huge blasts of solar matter. A coronal mass ejection is basically part of what we call a solar eruption. So a solar eruption happens when basically there's a big explosion on the sun. Uh, and in fact, it's really cool because those explosions are the biggest ones that happen in the solar system and they release as much energy as about a billion atom bombs going off over the course of just a few minutes. It's more energy than humanity has used ever. In Quebec, about 35 years ago, a coronal mass ejection, or a CME, caused a geomagnetic storm that knocked out power for the entire province. This shows what happened. <laughs> All five lines from James Bay went out at the same time. And just over 10 years ago, NASA says a massive CME barely missed Earth. If it had hit, they worried the ensuing storm could have caused trillions of dollars in damage to electronics and infrastructure. Coronal mass ejections, when they hit Earth, if they hit in the right configuration, they can cause all sorts of effects. Uh, the particles that interact with the atmosphere, they cause increased radiation in the atmosphere. That can cause uh, airplanes to have to reroute around the poles because they want to avoid that radiation. It, those particles can interact with satellites, and sometimes if they don't put the satellites in the safe mode properly, it can knock the satellites out. So we need to understand these things to understand how space weather affects life on Earth and all of our satellites in orbit. We know the sun's magnetic fields drive these solar explosions. And though we can't see magnetism, the charged particles that make up the sun's corona trace those magnetic lines. And yet, there's still so much that we don't understand about how it works. For starters, why is it so hot? The sun's core is about 15 million degrees Celsius. That's the hottest part. As you get farther out from the core to the surface, it really cools down to somewhere around 5,500 degrees Celsius. But the corona, the kind of outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere, the part that's farthest away from the core, that can shoot right back up in temperature up to 3 million degrees Celsius. Like, it gets hotter, which doesn't really make sense. What we know after many decades of studying the sun is that the energy, you know, it has to be getting up into the corona to make it hot. And that energy is carried by the sun's magnetic field that permeates the corona. The thing we're still really trying to understand is how the magnetic field can carry the energy up into the corona and how it can release that energy to heat the corona.
So a good start to studying the corona is just try to see the darn thing. My fist doesn't do a great job of blocking the sun's light because that light is still just bouncing and scattering every which way. The corona is still drowning in all of the ambient light. But something called a coronagraph can simulate a total eclipse right inside a telescope. And this video from NASA shows us how. As it turns out, by basically doing what I was doing outside. So you install this tiny mask inside the telescope that blocks the glare of the star that you're looking at. And by cleverly using mirrors and other optical gizmos, you can get a clearer picture of everything but the brightest source of light that you're trying to filter out. More advanced chronographs use different methods, but even then, there's always one problem. Without the eclipse, being present, you're still near the sun, right? And so you get blinded by stray light that's coming from the sun itself through ordinary optics. So what scientists have come to realize after launching satellites and space telescopes that gave us images like this, the Parker Solar Probe has slingshotted around the sun for years for these really close flybys. Like, imagine the sun is here, there's Mercury and Venus, and there's us. The solar probe gets this close over and over again. That's pretty close. For all the ways that we have of studying the sun, it's still hard to beat the fidelity of a good old fashioned, and for most of us, once in a lifetime opportunity of a total solar eclipse. So yes, we just wait until this big hunk of rock, the moon, blocks out the light just for a few minutes for any one person in any given place so we can get a really clear look at the sun's corona. There's actually a plan to extend the viewing time of the solar eclipse by strapping telescopes to a modified high-speed B-57 jet and then racing along the path of totality as the Earth spins, trying to stay in the moon's shadow for as long as possible. They did this in 2017, when the United States last saw a total solar eclipse. They even published a couple of papers showing off images that they captured with those high-resolution infrared cameras. They're doing it again this April 8th. And in case you're wondering what science you can actually do just by looking at the sun, well, how do you think we discovered helium? 1868. Two scientists, a French solar physicist and a British astronomer, were both independently observing the sun during a total solar eclipse, like the one coming up in April. And using a spectroscope to break down the light, they noticed a yellow line that didn't correspond to any known element. That element was helium. Helium comes from the Greek helios, which means the sun. It wouldn't be for another 20 years scientists would find helium on Earth. And since then, all that minute-by-minute minute observation, people would literally wait years for this opportunity, just a few minutes long at a time. We got so good at it that nowadays we can actually create predictive models of what the sun's corona is going to do at any given moment. We're making great strides. There are lots of really talented people working on these problems, but we're not quite to the point where we can predict when a solar eruption is going to happen. But predicting what the corona is going to look like, I think people have come a huge long way since uh, you know the 1800s when we began uh, really studying the corona. It is true that the sun's corona is just one small slice of solar science. You can Google things like solar winds and Earth's ionosphere to learn about some of the other ways that we're still advancing eclipse science. But on April 8th, if you look up and think to yourself, just another pretty picture, think again.